We wanted to develop a plenary session to introduce the history of Baltimore's arts and cultural community artists and activist tradition. The first name that people mentioned was Dr. Leslie King Hammond. I'm sure many people in Baltimore know her. Uh, she's a Baltimore-based artist and educator, but that hardly begins to describe her amazing career and many, many accomplishments. She was the founding director of the Center for Race and Culture at the Maryland Institute College of, of Art. And prior to that, she served as a project director for the Ford Phillips Morris Fellowships of Artists of Color at MICA. Today, she's a senior fellow at the Robert W. Deutsch Foundation. Dr. Hammond, King Hammond has produced numerous, numerous exhibitions and publications and received a long list of awards. Just to name a few, she's been recognized with the Lifetime Achievement Awards from the Studio Museum of, uh, in Harlem, MICA, the Women's Arts Caucus of the College Art Association, Howard University, and was awarded an Andy Warhol Curatorial Fellowship in 2008. And there are many, many more. In explaining her role, Dr. Kim, Dr. King Hammond has said, the intent of my professional activities in the art world at large has centered on facilitating the means to get artists of color and women more ideally represented in the larger arena. My efforts have focused on the redefinition of history as it more correctly profiles the role of artists in America. She's the perfect person to be kicking off this conference and situating us in this vibrant city, which she will do with the help of three local artist activists. I'm honored to introduce you to Dr. Leslie King Hammond. Thank you so much. Thank you. You okay? Yeah. <laughs> Wow, <laughs> big house. This is wonderful. This is absolutely wonderful. I am here to welcome you to Baltimore City as a transplant. I was born and raised in New York City, South Bronx. <laughs> then moved to South Jamaica, Queens, where all the jazz musicians grow up. And then as I um, began to be educated in that city from a family who were immigrants from the Caribbean island of Barbados, I was very clear about what I wanted to do, and that was to be committed to the arts. Of course, I was the weird bird in the family. Nobody believed at that time that a little colored girl could make a life in the arts. I didn't care. I knew who I was, I knew what I wanted to do, and I was determined. I didn't know how I was going to get there, but I know that that was the journey I wanted to take. So, since I was raised with a depression culture family, and you know what that means, waste not, want not, okay? You take what you have, you make what you want. If you don't have it, you must not need it, all right? If you really want it, you better work for it, all right? So I, at a very early age, under the direction of my mother, because I hated piano lessons, no disrespect to the musicians, <laughs> but I had an uncle who was a classical pianist, and they thought that giving me that culture would make a difference, not working. So I won a little competition at third grade, a poster painting contest. And they finally said, OK, she's hopeless. <laughs> so my mother began to find little recreation center after school programs. She began to let me go to the Bible, vacation Bible school sessions. Anywhere where they had free art materials, we didn't have any materials to do art per se. But here's the irony. My parents, my father was a shipbuilder in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. My grandmother was a master seamstress. My mother was a healer. Everybody was a maker. Fast forward through my history. I find myself here in Baltimore getting ready to go to Johns Hopkins to do a doctorate. That was another shocker for my family. What the hell is she doing? You know? What is going on? I said, I don't know. I'm on this journey. They gave me some money, and it's my job <laughs> to spend it on this fellowship, and I'm going to major in the arts. Granted, I had come out of Queens College with a BFA as an artist, but then I got a grant to do a PhD. I went, why not? Okay? <laughs> However, Hopkins got upset because I would not 
acquiesce to what was going on in the academic arena. Because what did I do? I got lonely for community arts. So I went over to the community affairs office at Johns Hopkins and I said, do you need help? They said, yeah, we want to put up an exhibition of kindergarten art and nobody will help us. I went, well, every year that I was there, that's what I did and anything else they needed to infuse cultural arts. Fast forward, it's now the 70s. Things are popping in Baltimore. I come out, I have my doctorate. All of a sudden, they appoint me dean of graduate school. Ooh, it's like a put me swope, for those of you who remember, all right? <laughs> and here I am, out in the community, all right? And I am asked by my president, Fred Lazarus, why are you in the community? You're supposed to be here teaching. I said, I'm doing that too. However, my research focused on Jacob Lawrence. Jacob Lawrence was raised by the community. When I did my research, which is one of my principal areas, it became very apparent, and I called it as such. He never went to an art school, per se. He never got a degree. I said, he was educated by the University of Harlem. All right? So when I came here and I started to look around at all these artists, and I see my minutes going, but that's all right, I got it. I said, this is the University of Baltimore City. There were creative people everywhere. The first two creative people I met here was John Waters and Joyce J. Scott. Whoa. I said, I think I'll hang a while. All right? Before I knew it, AFRAM, Artscape, Creative Alliance, all right? Maryland Art Place. All of these organizations started to flourish. A little gallery called Chroma Art Gallery down on Druid Hill Avenue was the only place artists of color could really be involved in an exhibition. It's okay. I kept working with them. Wrote columns for the Afro-American newspaper, Creative Community, all right? I covered everything from Intazaki Shange at center stage to every artist who was having a show in any small corner gallery. So. As we move forward, we now have a variety of serious, continuous organizations. We have Make Studios, which deals with abilities and art. We have Womb Works. I am apologizing for all those organizations that I cannot mention at this time. Wait a minute, I do have notes. I did make notes. OK? Arts Every Day, which is an organization at the Motor House under the inspiration of the Robert W. Deutsch Foundation, which has created two sites, OpenWorks, which is an incubator lab over on Greenmount Avenue, and Motorhouse on North Avenue as an arts hub to infuse and create safe, accessible spaces for artists. So when I was asked to pull this all together, we also have School 33. We also have the UB Blake Center. We also have the Bromo Celsa Tower. We also have the help of BOPA, Baltimore Arts, uh, Promotion in the Arts, and Visit Baltimore, who feed into this arena. So as I was asked to create an opening session, and they said, you know, you could do like a TED Talk, and I invite artists for TED Talks, and you only have seven minutes, and I'm down to nine, eight, <laughs> seven, six, I chose three amazing people, so without further ado, I would like to introduce Khabibi Ajanku, Dance Theater, Sankofa. I greet you with praise and celebration. Lamba is a dance, it is a rhythm, it is all kinds of history and folklore that is wrapped and positioned to bring praise and celebration. So I do this as an artist right here in Baltimore City. I do this. Ha, here we go. Ha ha. All right. I am Kibibi Ajanku. 
I make and present ethnically charged art. I engage in disruptive evolution through the arts. My passion embodies the thrust of the African diaspora and my creativity is ongoing, ever evolving, and an effort that speaks to my life journey. That being said, I am known broadly as the founding director of the Baltimore-based Sankofa Dance Theater. Yes, I am that standing founder. And that company has been in existence since 1989. It is so hard to stay. Yeah? Now, it's not just any dance company. It's an ethnic dance company, a very small niche, a slice, right? My forte is to impart the rich, treasured-filled, authentic traditions of the African diaspora. My company performs deeply researched and well-informed African material in the form of dance, music, and folkways. The work of the troupe is rooted in healing and bringing intercultural understanding to the global village while staying true to the definition of the word Sankofa, which means to learn from the past in effort to build for the future. Sankofa Dance Theater, theater reaches back into the rich legacy of African culture and history to move forward into greater awareness and sensitivity for the world community. We are a global village. We are. Our connection to art is real. Through ethnic expression, I endeavor to emphasize all the different parts of the world from one community as one community, from the thrust of one community that's all linked together. What better way to link than through art? Art ignites cooperation, art ignites tolerance, art ignites understanding. Art has the potential to cement a healing pathway. Oh, man. So I like to think of my work as having the responsibility of being many things. It is eclectic and innovative. It is ancient while at the same time new world. And it is always, 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 always changing. It is general yet specific and more importantly, it is a prescient and far-sighted all in one fell swoop, right? You can see the past, you can see the present, and you can see the future, yeah. Well, my endeavors include, but are not limited to, contemporary art and artifacts, performance art, visual art. My artistry is layered with and entrenched in indigenous folkways. My work embodies research, identity, and the gathering of elements of the African retention in hopes of invoking intuitive memories that reach back into the ancestral histories and stories that impart the here and now. That is some sexy stuff, don't you think? <laughs> It just means it's yesterday, it's today, it's tomorrow, it's ever evolving, and it can be whatever we need it to be for our tomorrows. The connection never stops, the depth never stops, and that's how we all have to be in this world, right? That's change. That is change. Uh, so, yes, my work is the past connecting to that ongoing, going back to fetch it thing that is the definition of the word Sankofa in and of itself. It is the present. I've utilized Sankofa Dance Theater over a 30 year spectrum to imagine a tomorrow. I've used it as a sharp edge activist art sword that make African traditions relevant in an urban American environment. Building community around this thing that is forever old and ancient. I've had a hand 
actually had a hand in shifting the culture of this city. Hmm. It's future because the power of culture in and of itself is futuristic. African tradition is this circular thing that is futuristic. It's fueled by the past and it funnels into current work and it is visionary for tomorrow. So that is a 30 year legacy. When afforded the opportunity, I carefully curate. Uh, the bottom line is that Sankofa Dance Theater creates and presents world-class authentic African art. You can find me today not only touching this thing that is an African art form for today and for tomorrow, but you can also find me in the hallways and the offices of the Greater Baltimore Cultural Alliance, having that voice that is about diversity and uh, intersectionality and inclusion with the Urban Arts Leadership as its wheelhouse. You can also find me in the hallways of Coppin State University because pedagogy is a wonderful way to give voice to all that you believe in and all that will craft tomorrow. I am Kibibia Janku, and Sankofa Dance Theater has been my sword. I thank you. I remember once giving a talk in, and I'm going to fudge on this monitor here for a minute, uh, in Chicago at a National Endowment Conference. And uh, one of the questions that came up from the panel was, um, how do we validate our artists? And I remember then being a young, audacious scholar. And I said, you know, I really don't think there is a difference between that artist who is educated with a degree and those artists who are self-educated. They had to get a taxi cab for me at the corona <laughs> because they literally ran me out of the city, okay? Artists, degreed artists, were running up to the podium uh, cussing me in very strong terms. How could you say that? Well, I'm going to give you an example because in Baltimore, I truly believe this is a maker city. And in a maker city, you understand, we are very hypersensitive to the materials all around us. And we are hypersensitive to our environment. And the fact that we are really pissed that the media decided to use us as a bad example of what riots look like. Do not leave this city understanding that. No, we had an uprising. We are change agents. We are change agents. And to that end, years ago, I met this incredible artist, Joyce Scott said, I was driving her home, go down this street, go down this street, you have to see this. I said, no, I'm tired, I need to go home. Go down this street, go down this street, Claywood, Claywood. And I went down this street and I went, oh my God, the big OMG. With that, I introduce you to my heart, Lauren Cornish. So, I grew up in Baltimore, so I left Baltimore and I go to California. And while I'm in California, I realize this is wonderful. I, 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 I arrive, it's, it's wonderful, it's great, and then I realize I got to go back to Baltimore. And when I came back to Baltimore, I brought California with me. And this is what happened. There's a row house. In Baltimore, we're famous for row houses. These little small 10 by 12 boxes with a couple floors. I decided if I have to live in a row house in Baltimore and the people in the inner city have to walk by brick every day and see the same colored brick, red brick, white brick, blue brick, yellow brick, we can do something with the brick. 
We can change brick. And so I changed brick, and I covered brick, every drop of brick, and people went, you can't change brick. My God! Brick has been a part of Baltimore all our lives. How dare you change brick? And in the course of me changing brick, my neighbors did everything but hang me. My God! They said, you can't do this. But the kids, the kids, the young adult says, oh my God, you can change brick? <laughs> you can make something out of brick? You can change brick? And my whole thing was to bring change, was to change your mind, was to change your mindset, was to make you think that you can. Living in the inner city, you see brick and concrete, and brick and concrete usually says, no, my God! because it stops, but when you change brick, when you make something that, that couldn't be done, it opens a child's mind. It gives them opportunity. You take art and you take it to, you take the uneducated artists and you educate the kids who don't have an education about change. Most of the inner city don't go to college. My God! Leslie said, please don't do that. Mm -mm. How do you do that, Lauren? How do you do that? How, that? That's incredible. Well, this is how you do it. How, well, 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 this leads to other conversations. Well, how do you do that? Well, how do you do, well, how do you do that? Well, how can I become this? How can I go that? This is how you do it. You just begin and conversations start. Because if we don't start conversations, the end of conversations is hopefully a better environment for our use. This house is right in the Freddie Gray area. Right in the area, my God! Right there. So what do you do when you change a house? You buy another one. <laughs> you buy another house, three houses down, and you change that one. That's what you do. That's what you do. And before, the, and, and before the people who are on the other street are so mad that I'm changing and they call the city, and the city, and by the time the city got there, because you know they take a week or two, by the time the city got there, I had already done it. <laughs> I had already changed it. And so the kids are like, oh my God. Oh my God. And the change in my neighborhood, the change in the environment. The, 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 and you know what else happened? You know who else changed? the people who were against me in the beginning. A lot of times, us as artists have to push past the thoughts and minds of those who are blocked by brick, who are blocked by concrete. We are the conduits. You are the conduits of change. My goodness! And a lot of times, we suffer. We don't have enough money for this program. We come out of our pockets for kids. We come out of our pockets for programs because we and we feel and we are we are feel, we are given the vision. We are given the light. We are given the mantle. It is up to us to change. And sometimes we have to sacrifice so much for change. There's a lot of sacrifice in this. My goodness. Didn't have a plan. You know, a lot of companies want me to do stuff and they want me to draw out stuff. I'm like, I'm not that guy. I don't draw out stuff, I just begin. What do you want me to do? I don't do that. My goodness! Didn't have a plan. Sometimes we don't need a plan. Remember, it is inside of us. It is not on a piece of paper, and it unwinds as we begin the process. We be, if we just begin the process, it unwinds, and it continues to feed me. It feeds me as I go. I had no idea what this was going to look like. All I knew that I bought this house, and the next day I began putting glass on it. Had no idea where it was going. We don't need an idea, because it is in us, and it develops as we go along. How dare you ask me to make a final plan of something that hasn't been given to me yet? My goodness! I am not a contractor. We are not contractors. The next time somebody asks you something, I am not a contractor. You go get a contractor, child. I'm an artist. Next. So, <laughs> as if the outside didn't look, 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 so, as if the outside wasn't enough. Uh-oh, go back. How do you go back? Somebody go back from, bam! 
Child, every, every glass house needs a damn glass bathtub. <laughs> Shit. Once your ass is on glass. <laughs> so when a kid, when a kind, when a kid, when an adult, when a person, when an organization, when a company sees a glass bathtub, who takes a bath in a glass bathtub? <laughs> in fact, who has a glass? Come on. The possibilities of art are endless. They are endless, they are abounding, they're, they're wonderful, they're great. And if we don't stop, the, if we don't put the limit on the idea, then then the idea will, if we put the limit on the idea, then the idea will never flourish. It'll never come to life. If you say no, if you say no to the thing that's inside of you, then you say no to the future of the seed that's been planted in you. I'm Lauren Cornish, thank you. <laughs> love you. I love you. <clears throat> Please know that what you are witnessing is not even the tip of the iceberg <laughs> of what this city has to offer. He has a house down in Fells Point. Oh my God, you need to go take a chance and go down and see that house. He also creates affordable work that people come in, fall in love, and they can buy it and walk out the door with it. But he is one of many artists. This is the culture of what this city is about. Now, let me introduce the so-called last person on my mini TED Talks. I am, I am committed to developing uh, a panel here where uh, we have two seasoned artists, but then we need some young artists. So I text the artists. Because you know with the youth, if you don't text or Instagram or something, you're not in it, all right? So I text, all right? Because you know, I know this from having improved the relationship uh, with my sons. You know, if I call, it's like, mm-mm. If I text, mm-hmm, all right? So I send this text out, and before you know it, okay, I get no answer. And I go, mm, I don't know. So time is, my clock is running down, and I need to secure. So I pick up the phone, and I call this number, and the young woman answers, and she said, I'm not the person that, you know, this is a different number, and um, that's a wonderful opportunity you're talking about. And she said, um, you know, but I do. I'm a spoken word poet. I was looking for a spoken word. She said, but I, I also have a little thing that I do with some digital stuff. And I'm going, hmm. And she starts to tell me all the things that she's doing and where she's going. And I'm not going to preempt her presentation. But with that, I want to show you the aggressiveness, the vision, the genius of young people now in this city who are standing up to take the baton from us, do you understand, as we hand it to them. Remember, all you old heads in the audience, you're supposed to pass the baton. <laughs> It's not about who's the star in the room. It's about who are you creating to create the next future and the platform. With that, I introduce you to Briaria Sims. <laughs> hear me? Yes. Awesome. My name is Briera Sims. I'm a digital spoken word poet, something that I conceive myself. I do music. I'm a visual artist. I'm a vocalist. I'm a writer. Um, I love culture. Where I grew up has impacted me tremendously. It's impacts on impacts on impacts. I'm from West Baltimore. I have a West Side story. 
Um, I grew up in Upton Druid Heights. And um, growing up there was amazing because I grew up in this urban area. And then at the same time, I was going to Catholic private school in the county. And I used to come back with all these new things that I learned at school, telling my friends I'm in a hood. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm learning about you know Catholicism. I'm, I'm learning this, I'm learning that. And it was really amazing. So it was like an urban rediscovery that took place for me. Observe, listen, believe, innovate. Those are four things that I love to stick to. And my education experience started at Micah Pre-College where I um, took film, video editing, and sound recording, which is where my voice became something to me that I just started to love. Um, my art teachers always inspired me to just go the extra route. Um, they introduced me to various aspects, various aspects of my artistry, um, self-portraits, and drawing myself, painting myself. It led me to go inside of myself. I also did written poetry at church youth programs and also communication classes helped me with projecting my voice and metaphors in psychology begin to fuel my basis for my spoken word style. The upresting. This event here is what really set the tone for my art educational community platform. This, um, this project was a community activism project that took place right on Pennsylvania Avenue, which is a well-known long strip in Baltimore. And um, I was able to engage with a lot of members of the community. We had two microphones, we had mm, two stereo systems set up where clips from the Freddie Gray uprising and the riots and everything was playing through. You heard sirens, you heard protesting. And in the course of that, artists like myself, we all came up on the mic and diffused all of the things that you heard with positive affirmations, with words of encouragement. Then we allow people from the community to come on and speak their mind as well. You had people recovering, um, people from drugs come up on the mic. You had people that, who just dropped their kids off at school come up on the mic. So it was, it was really uplifting and um, we really brought a lot of awareness this day. And here's a clip. clip was from a project called Control, and it went a little bit like this. Wanna be in control, but you don't really know. Gotta take control. And what that means is we want to take control. There's so many things that goes on in our life. We have to take control over this. We might have kids. We might have family. You have to take control over all these aspects, but it starts with self-control first. And what I realized in saying this and in this platform over the riots and the sirens and the protesting, I realized we have to take self-control and accountability for our own actions first. So that was a part of my upresting. Forget the uprising, we're upresting. Thank you all, and I'm, I'm really honored to be here.